All right, let's start class with our prayer. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Tyburn Martyrs, pray for us. St. Amos, pray for us. In the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. So we're continuing to examine the three prophets who prophesied during the reign of Jeroboam II in the northern kingdom. Uh, we've already taken a look at the book of Jonah. And now we're going to go over the book of the prophet Amos. So Amos prophesied in the northern kingdom circa 750 and 760 BC. All right, his name Amos literally means burden. So you can imagine uh, Amos going to the northern kingdom, condemning their paganism, uh, as well as some other practices that we'll see him condemn in the text. Uh, and be him being ascribed to as this burden, all right, upon the aristocracy, upon the king of Israel, the northern kingdom. All right, so let's begin uh, by looking at chapter 1, verse 1. The words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel. All right, so this first line tells us something very important. He's among the shepherds of Tekoa. That is located in the southern kingdom, in the kingdom of Judah. So he is a southerner who has been sent by God to the northern kingdom of Israel. All right, which he saw concerning Israel. All right, so he sent to the north to deliver a message to the people living there. In the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. And in the days of Jeroboam, the son of Joash, that is Jeroboam II, king of Israel, two years before the earthquake. All right. Uh, so what we get in this introduction is that historical context matters. And this is going to be a theme that I'm going to beat on constantly uh, in the prophetic literature is that historical context matters. The author is telling you, all right, what you're about to read from the prophet Amos was a message that was intended for the north under the reign of Jeroboam II. Once you understand what Israel was like under Jeroboam II, well, then everything starts to open up and this text makes sense. If you read this text, though, completely outside of the historical context, that's when you end up with really wacky uh, theological interpretations. Um, it's super common for our beloved internet theologians to uh, take like obscure uh, scripture passages from prophetic literature and then talk about how they've calculated the end of the world or how this applies to like the current presidency, what have you. Um, but that is not how the prophetic literature is supposed to be interpreted and understood. First and foremost, before you can understand um, you know, the, uh, the spiritual senses of scripture, you have to be grounded in the literal sense. What is the author saying to his audience and who is his audience? All right, so his audience is not necessarily people living in the 21st century, all right? Now, as the Holy Spirit inspires scripture, all right, and it's the word of God, and the word of God is living, we can learn things from these books of the prophets that are still entirely relevant to us today. But that relevant message can only be understood, all right, or it can be easily missed if we don't understand what the original context was for the message uh, that was delivered. So we're, we'll go through that. So one of the things you have to keep in mind is that in all these prophetic books is that historical context matters, and you usually get that at the introduction of the book. The author tells you, this is when these events took place. This is when this message was delivered is for these people. All right. Uh, so moving on to verse 2. And he said, the lion roars from Zion, 
and utters his voice from Jerusalem. The pastures of the shepherds mourn, and the top of Carmel withers. All right, so we get some poetry to start off this book in synonymous parallelism. All right, the Lord roars from Zion, and he utters his voice from <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> utters his voice from Jerusalem. Clearly there's synonymous parallelism there. Zion and Jerusalem are the same place. The pastures of the shepherds mourn in the top of Carmel withers. All right? Carmel is usually uh, a very fertile hill where sheep could go up and graze. All right? But the shepherds are now mourning because Carmel withers. All right? Carmel, remember, was also the home of the rain god Baal. Verse 3. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Damascus, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have threshed Gilead with threshing sledges of iron. So I will send a fire upon the house of Hazael, and it shall devour the strongholds of Benadad. I will break the bar of Damascus and cut off the inhabitants from the valley of Ven, and him that holds the scepter from Bethaden, and the people of Syria shall go into exile and incur says the Lord. All right, so in the beginning of Amos, he condemns the foreign nations that surround the northern kingdom. All right, uh, verse 6 is a condemnation for uh, Philistia, the Philistines. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Gaza, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they carried into exile a whole people to deliver them up to Edom. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Gaza, and it shall devour her strongholds. I will cut off the inhabitants from Ashdod, and him that holds the scepter from Ashkelon. I will turn my hand against Ekron, and the remnant of the Philistines shall perish, says the Lord. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Tyre, right? this is a condemnation of the Phoenicians to the north, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they delivered up a whole people to Edom, and did not remember the covenant of brotherhood. So I will send a fire upon the wall of Tyre, and it shall devour her strongholds. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Edom, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because he pursued his brother with the sword. All right, it's a reference to Edom going to war and pursuing the Israelites. Um, Edom, the Edomites, remember, are the descendants of Esau, Esau the brother of Jacob. And cast off all pity, and his anger tore perpetually, and he kept his wrath forever. So I will send a fire upon Taman, and it shall devour the strongholds of Bozra. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of the Ammonites, and for four, I will not revoke the punishment, because they have ripped up women with child in Gilead, that they might enlarge their border. So I will kindle a fire in the wall of Rabbah, and it shall devour her strongholds with shouting in the day of battle with a tempest in the day of the whirlwind, and their king shall go into exile, he and his princes together, says the Lord. All right, here we get another uh, bad chapter division. Um, you can tell that there's this theme going on of God condemning um, these nations around the northern kingdom, and it continues, thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Moab. All right, and then he continues, Thus says the Lord for three transgressions of Judah, the southern kingdom. I will not revoke the punishment because they have rejected the law of the Lord and have not kept his statutes, but their lives, their lies have led them astray after which their father walked. That was uh, chapter two, verse four, not chapter two, verse five. So I send, so I will send fire upon Judah and it shall devour the strongholds of Jerusalem. Thus says the Lord. Okay, so after the introduction, where you get this condemnation of the kingdom surrounding the northern kingdom of Israel, we now come to the main focus of the book, all right, which is Amos' condemnation of the north. Thus says the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel and for four, I will not revoke the punishment because they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. All right, so in the Northern Kingdom, this is the reign of Jeroboam II, 2 Kings chapters 14 through 16. And we find that the in, these, uh, in the economic structure of this kingdom, it's flourishing. However, the 
uh, rich and the mighty are abusing the poor. All right, and this is going to be one of the themes that Amos condemns the northern kingdom for. All right, that they sell the righteous for silver and the needy for a pair of shoes. They that trample the head of the poor into the dust of the earth and turn aside the way of the afflicted. A man and his father go into the same maiden so that my holy name is profaned. They lay themselves down beside every altar. Upon garments taken in pledge, in the house of their God, they drink the wine of those who have been fined. All right. And so through uh, the majority of the text of Amos is condemnation of Israel, the northern kingdom. All right. Amos is referring to specific crimes that are being committed uh, by the people who live in Israel in the north. And we'll go ahead and jump forward to uh, chapter 7. So at chapter 7, verse 10, uh, we get a, an event from the life of Amos uh, during the reign of Jeroboam II. And chapter 7, verses 10 uh, to the end, to chapter 8, is a nice summary of the life of the prophets. It's a summary of the life of the prophets and what they had to put up with constantly. All right, so any one of these prophets uh, that you get to in the Old Testament, um, this is a very typical summary of how their life goes. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. Amaziah, the priest of Bethel. All right, at Bethel, and this time, is the golden calf, one of the two golden calves that was set up by Jeroboam the first. So this Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, this is a pagan priest, the one who offers sacrifices before this golden calf. Sent to Jeroboam, king of Israel. It's Jeroboam the second. Saying, Amos has conspired against you in the midst of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all his words. For thus Amos has said, Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to Amos, O seer, go, flee away to the land of Judah, and eat bread there, and prophesy there. All right, so Amaziah sees Amos as a pagan prophet. He has this understanding that Amos is free to say what he wants um, in order to kind of bend the will of the God. Uh, but that's obviously not what the role of the prophet is in the Judeo-Christian tradition. It's simply to speak God's word. All right, the prophet is the one who speaks God's word. And so he says, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah and eat bread there. Make your living there. Go there to eat your bread. Someone will pay you to prophesy down there. Verse 13, but never again prophesy Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is a temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor prophet's son. All right, so he, when he's saying he's not a prophet, he means he's not one of those professional prophets for pay that go around, like think of Balaam back in the book of Numbers. Nor prophet's son, meaning he's not a disciple who studies under a prophet. All right, not that he's not biologically a prophet's son, but that he, uh, think of like Elisha and Elijah. He did not spend his life following a prophet around the way Elisha followed Elijah around. But I am a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. Uh, sycamore trees in the Middle East, they bear a, uh, a very small fruit. It's a, an ugly little fig, all right? Not the juicy kind of figs uh, that are delicious that you can buy dried out you know, at grocery stores, but these are bad tasting little spotty fruits. All right, so this is the uh, poorest people would go out into the wilderness to find their food and they'd find these sycamores and these sycamores would produce these wild figs. Uh, they were not good to the taste. Um, but what Amos is indicating here is that he, you know, he was impoverished, all right? I'm not a prophet nor a prophet's son. I'm a herdsman and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following the flock. And the Lord said to me, go prophesy to my people Israel. Now, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. You say, do not prophesy against Israel and do not preach against the house of Isaac. Therefore, thus says the Lord, your wife shall be a harlot in the city and your sons and your daughters shall fall by the sword. 
and your land shall be parceled out by line. You shall, you yourself shall die in an unclean land, and Israel shall surely go into exile away from its land. All right, so jump ahead. Now, the book of Amos is unique in the sense where there is a lot of condemnation and very little uh, redemption. There is redemption at the end. Uh, typically, when you're reading a prophetic book in the Old Testament, they have the following structure. The first half, um, God is sending his prophet to make the people aware of the sin that they're committing in the condemnation that comes with committing that sin and calls them to repentance. And then the second half of the prophetic book is all about restoration, all right? How God will then, after they have received their punishment and once they have turned their hearts back to him and they've repented, he is then going to take them back, all right, as his own children. And he's going to restore uh, to them what he had taken away. What's unique about Amos is that the amount of restorative language is very, very limited. Usually it's closer to 50-50 uh, in most books. But in Amos chapter 9, verse 8, you can make a note here, all right? This is where the, uh, the restoration begins, all right? So everything before chapter 9, verse 8 is condemnation, all right? This is the sin you're committing. And then chapter 9, verse 8 and following is all about restoration, and so we'll read through chapter 9, verse 8 to the end, so you can get a sense of that restorative language. Behold, the eyes of the Lord are upon the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the surface of the ground, except that I will not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Lord. For behold, I will command and shake the house of Israel among all the nations, as one shakes with a sieve, but no pebble shall fall upon the earth. All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword, who say evil shall not overtake or meet us. In that day I will raise up the booth of David that has fallen and repair its breaches, and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old, that they may possess the remnant of Edom, and all the nations who are called by my name, says the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper, and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine, and all the hills shall flow with it. I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel, and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine, and they shall make gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them upon their land, and they shall never again be plucked up out of the land which I have given them, says the Lord your God. So one of the common themes in the Old Testament, especially in the prophetic literature, is comparing Israel to this vineyard, um, to God's vineyard. And in the New Testament, when we get to Christ's parable, uh, parables, he takes that vineyard imagery and then expounds upon it. Um, and we'll take a couple look, take a look at those parables when we get to them in Matthew's Gospel. Um, but just so you know, like even the parables that Christ tells. It's within the tradition of the prophetic literature and the audience who's hearing Jesus tell stories, you know, about a vineyard owner who sends his stewards to the vineyard, um, you know, to collect the rent, what have you. This would have, you know, been familiar to them because they were familiar with the words of the prophets, right? And it helps give you an insight into interpreting and understanding what Jesus means by his parables. Uh, thus concludes the book of Amos.